there's two ways of looking at something like you feel your expression, uh, your voice, your gestures, your facial movement frozen, right? So um, there's the why and there's the uh, acquiring muscle, so to speak, muscle in parentheses, because it's, it, it, it's actual muscle and it's also emotional or psychological muscle. Right, so there are the two things. So the the why is something you could explore, and sometimes one can explore such things. Other times you can't, you just can't, right? Because you don't know. Some of it is just habit. Some of it is uh, genetic. I don't know if you notice that, uh, and also it's geographical. That the further north people live, the less expression they have on their face. And the further closer to the equator somebody lives, the the more expression they have. So you have you know people like talking with their hands and fan and, and also music and and colors. And then of course the further north you go, the the less and less and less there is of that. And I uh, used to have a a co teacher named James Bay who uh, died, and it's a whole story that I'm not going into. But he was in uh, before he started teaching he was a nurse a registered nurse in Canada and he worked in the Inuit uh, regions of Canada and he said he needed an in- interpreter not only because uh, he didn't speak the language but because there was no affect right so and, and not because the people were traumatized which is the other reason why you could not have a lot of affect, meaning a lot of you know, gestures and mm-hmm. expressions and reactions. Mm-hmm. So, so he said people would be in excruciating pain and it wouldn't show. Mm-hmm. So there's, there's certain programmings that are that they're not psychological. And then, of course, there's always the, um, uh, the looking into, was there some kind of a frozen trauma response to something so that's something you can do at your leisure it's really a secondary consideration where it's coming from the primary consideration is how can you train your voice and your face to move the way you want it to move right so so that's um that falls into the category of what we when we talk about these things we talk about skill development Right, or I should say, when I say we, um, <laughs> Steve talks about skill development, right? Because he has that kind of, he's very methodical. He he has he speaks about these things in a very organized way. So, skill development is something you do till you have the muscle, the ability, uh, the technique, right? And then. Uh, you can apply that skill artistically. Having no skill but being incredibly uh, divinely inspired is great, but, you know, if you're divinely inspired to play the piano and you don't know how to actually play the piano, it's not going to sound that good. (laughs) If you only have really good skill but you're uh, you're missing the artistic, divine, or whatever you want to call it, devotional uh, expression you're going to sound like a machine. Right? So it's the combination of the two. So the first thing that you would do is you would seek out modalities that train your voice and the muscles of your face. It just happens that such modality exists. <laughs> it is called singing. <laughs> Wow. Yes. <laughs> and lo and behold, there's people who teach that. You know? So, and by the way, you have no problem expressing things, right? Your face is very expressive, actually. Uh, at least in this moment, it was. Right? So, so it's probably partly habit and maybe partly trauma, right? That that you just go like blank, yeah. uh, but you're capable. It's just a matter of training it. So what I would do is I'd find somebody, or if you don't want to find somebody to begin with, um, find some uh, YouTube clips of opera singers 
Or I'm, I'm pretty sure you could go on YouTube and find somebody who teaches you the basic <laughs> opera singing scale. Right, because everything exists on YouTube, as we well know, right? And and just sit in front of of YouTube and do the, the you know the the full voice thing and the big faces and you know stuff like that. So, and and maybe then one day you'll go and do a work with a voice coach because there is certain things that come with the muscles and how your diaphragm goes and where you breathe from and you know the, how you move your body. That really, if somebody just goes do it like this, you go. Oh, right. Yeah. right. And then, then you can practice it. So it's usually good to find a professional, but you might be able to, an interim professional on YouTube, yeah. you know. Well, here's the thing. Uh, one of the nice things, of course, about singing is that you can pick songs that emotionally affect you. Right, so for what you are describing, singing really is kind of the you know the holy grail because you can you can pick music you know that scares you, you can pick music that opens you up, you can pick music that makes you cry, you can rock out right whatever you want to do, the emotion will come with it, and then particularly if you just play the music in the background and you move your body with it it will very quickly infuse your entire being, right? It moves up from the body into your throat, out your mouth, into your face. Now, then there's other things you can do. I highly recommend, <laughs> this is another good one. Look up, uh, you might know this. You know what a haka is? <laughs> okay, good. Haka, it's H-A-K-A. I'm happy to send you some specific clips. It's a New Zealand, native New Zealanders, Maoris, have a have a, a very beautiful art form. It's a kind of a war dance. Yeah, and so a big part of that is that you learn how to <laughs> that, do that, right? Yeah. And, and and scream while you're doing it, right? So you can you can uh, learn how to imitate these, you know, very exaggerated facial movements. Chinese opera also very good, right? It's hard to listen to, but man, you know. <laughs> Maybe put it on silent and just, <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> and, and so the key is just to really exaggerate your expression. And you can do it in the mirror, which is also quite fun. Don't start in the mirror, I'd say. <laughs> might put you off, right? But after a while, you can do that in the mirror. Um, and that's, that's a good way to, to, to work with that. And then... Don't worry about how connected it is to begin with. That will happen. It's a matter of uh, establishing the proper connections in the neural pathways and everything, right? So that in the beginning you're confused and doesn't feel authentic because it's not authentic. Nothing ever is authentic till you have done it enough times, right? So just, just go with it and have as much fun as you can. One of the things that's very, very important, this is for everyone, when we talk about skill development, when you learn a skill, the skill is learned through repetition, and everything that goes into that repetition is uploaded as that skill. So what that means is if you have stress, tension, frustration, anxiety, while you're learning that skill, every time you access that skill, those emotions also upload. So that, that's to question number one. Question number two, when do you know that a relationship is over or when should you stay? When do you know when to leave and when do you know that it's, that it's worth staying and working on it? Okay. I'll start with the very black and white uh, things, right, that you can consider. Now, of course... Mm, Knowing that one should leave a relationship and leaving a relationship are not even in the same room right? for most people. Because, because the reason you are in the relationship is because there's a payoff of some sort um, that goes way beyond what you say the payoff of the relationship is. That's true for all of us in all kinds of relationships, including business and things like that. And no matter how much you know that you should be leaving, you're not going to leave till you can leave. Emo emotionally, physically, financially, whatever, right? People don't leave uh, till, till there's a really compelling reason to leave. But so 
That all aside, signs that you should leave a relationship that are pretty clear cut is if you're in uh, emotional or physical danger, right? That's, that's pretty clear cut. Now, physical danger is easier to see than emotional danger, but patterns of uh, ongoing emotional abuse or physical abuse are clear signs that you should be leaving. Um, I would say this, there would be one, there would be a third thing that I would consider and I would get would potentially get into hot water for saying that because it's not very politically correct. I would not be with an addict. I would not be with an addict because um, active addiction, you're not actually with that person. Right? So that to me would be a absolute clear sign that you should leave. That doesn't mean you stop loving the person or whatever, but if there's an active addiction, you need to get the fuck away. Right? And then support that person from afar you know, or from a safe distance. Um, and in that category would be, of course, drug addictions, uh, alcohol addictions, gambling, sex addictions. Sex addictions are a little bit dicey because there's a lot of um, propaganda there. But, you know, if you're with somebody who spends all his money on coke and whores, you should probably get out. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so those are the obvious signs, right? Other uh, considerations that make it irreconcilable is when you have very different values or needs. You want a child, your partner doesn't want a child. Right? Uh, your partner wants to move somewhere and join the jihadis. You don't. Right? I mean, those are some pretty... Yeah, there, I mean, there's versions of that that are a little bit less uh, extreme, but religious or cultish. Those are, those are irreconcilable differences, and they, and they can't be reconciled. So that's that. Those are the clear-cut ones. Other than that, I said this yesterday. In in the context of career, there is biological clock considerations. So then, all that's left is is the person you're with somebody who likes you and you like them. Yes. Okay. Good. That's the base. The first thing, like you like who they are as a human being. Okay. Good. And he likes who he or she. I don't know what you're. Yeah. He. Yeah, so is is um, he likes you, he likes what you're about, yeah. he likes your personality. But are you saying that fundamentally he's not sexually attracted to you? Are you, are you having sex? And not anymore. And how long have you been together? Okay. But before then, when you had sex... Um, you feel the attraction to him. And can you feel that he's not attracted to you? And we don't know if that's just so with you or if that's age-related. I mean, I would have to ask a lot more questions to get very specific, right? So, so which we can't do in here because it will, everybody will, you know, start rolling their eyes back in their head because it's going to ha go, have to go into fine detail. But as a general consideration, and I said this yesterday, I'm going to give this disclaimer again. This is, of course, only my opinion based on both my own explorations and my clinical experience. I would not subject myself to feelings of sexual inadequacy, personally and as, a, as, a, as an advice to you, mm -hmm. right? Because... Nothing kills your soul faster and more permanently, <laughs> more permanent, right? Than the, the, the subtle or not so subtle feeling of not being sexually adored and desired. And with 48, 48 you said, that is not a road you want to go down. I'm sorry to say it like that, right? That Because then comes all the menopausal shit and, you know... I mean, I don't need to tell you, right? I mean, there's, there's a whole, there's a whole, and, and it doesn't have to be as horrible as I'm now saying it is, right? Some people, <laughs> some people have no trouble menopausally. Other people are so dry that, you know, they move and dust flows off them, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, and there's a, there's a, there's a wide variety in there, but 
in the in in the changing of your sexual landscape what one would wish for you and anyone is a partner with whom you can explore that free of other sexual concerns right because it's going to have if it has to you know things have to change a bit and you know things like your periods are no longer regular so you never know where the fuck you are and you smell weird and whatever right like <laughs> like you know and, and those are real concerns as some of you know right so the last thing you know is when you have one of those cycles where you, you your body smells bizarre is a guy who's already kind of like barely keeping it up right for whatever reasons it, it has nothing it, it might have to do with you not being sexually compatible or it might be totally his stuff or his hormonal what whatever but an ongoing rejection of you as a sexual being feels like a very bad idea. That's what I would say. And judging from your exhale, I, I think this has crossed your mind. <laughs> right? It's a very bad idea. Because these are not exactly areas where you can... This is not like I lose 20 pounds and color your hair kind of a situation, even though I wouldn't suggest you do that either. Right? But... But because if a guy doesn't like you the way you are, uh, you know, there is plenty of other men and women in the world f for that. Um, so I'm saying that as, as just a big consideration that I under, you know, I wouldn't do that either. I wouldn't say that to a younger woman either. I wouldn't say, oh, yeah, but you have a little bit more leeway there when you're young hot shit right when you're like 23 or 25 or you know or something and your tits are up here and every guy is a is a possibility you're probably going to get a good idea of your sexual worth but when you're in your 40s and you're discerning and not that many men look good to begin with you don't want to go down some side arm of some river and get stuck in the swamps for a couple of years doing constant therapy trying to make yourself into the woman that he's hot about right mm -hmm. that's it it feels like a not so good idea mm -hmm. that said um there is men and you might have one of those, right, who just need so much variety that any woman, after they've had her, is no longer that interesting, right? They always have to have the next sparkly new thing, and if, but then if they decide they want to be in a relationship, they're in a real internal conflict, and, and it has nothing to do with you. It's just the mechanisms of how they are wired, and... That's not easy to fix either. So if he's one of those guys, you can do all the therapy in the world. It's not going to change. Now, like I said, that's not to say that you're not going to stay with him. But just keep in mind that your sense of sexual self-worth, sexual sensual embodied self-worth is of very, very high importance. complicated in the sense even if you work on the trauma right even if you come to the origin of why that is which is not that important but and it's pro probably fairly clear cut right i mean these things are you know you, you can point to them in in these ways you can do all the healing you want around that that's an imprint you know like like you were saying it's an energetic signature yeah that will be with you till the day you leave your body. So um, the, the primary work is interrupting the patterns uh, before they cause harm, being aware of the patterns so you go into certain things with open eyes and are not surprised by them happening, right? Um, and can keep yourself from dissociating within that particular pattern right sounds like you're doing all of those kind of things with trauma therapy and, and it, you know that's what you do you go here it comes you know this is what my body does here are tools to not let my body you know freeze in that um, when it comes to picking men you are going to pick those kind of intense guys 
You're just going to. Because like you said, if they're emotionally uh, there and loving, your body feels pain. If they're physically, uh, uh, emotionally unpleasant, your body relaxes. Right? So that's a, that's a really unpleasant double bind. Right, really unpleasant double bite. Um, so, well, you could do that, but then the abbot of the monastery would uh, would somehow repeat that pattern on you. <laughs> right. Thank you. So there is no way but through, so to speak. But the thing is, you have to know that that's the way it's going to go. Right. So uh, your current lover falls into the physically okay emotionally not okay domain or physically not okay or okay so it's too early to tell but you're having sex and it's not painful it's yes necessary. yes so he's yes. already caused physical harm yes but he's emotionally okay <laughs> not good but but at least you know he's emotionally safe but he's caused physical harm yes. and of course will cause physical harm for the rest of your life okay what i'm going to say is this is not this is not a commonplace, I'm saying this to everyone else here, right? This is not a commonplace advice that you should, you should uh, adopt for your own life, right? This is specifically for you. And we can have a, a, an in-depth conversation outside of the workshop context for this because it's very, very detailed. But essentially, the way to go at this is to preempt the accidental injury for the um, willing injury. Your, the, the way you get injured is it happens to you. You could also get injured, and when I'm saying injured, I mean this very lightly, in an organized, sanctioned fashion. So that the pain inflicted is pain that is essentially consensual pain. It's not for the sake of the masochism. It's for the sake of dismantling the pattern. Because the way the pattern goes is you're emotionally safe so far, right? So we have unemotionally safe, physically open, right? Don't want that. Not good. No, no, no need to engage in that. Um, emotionally safe with a guy who you like, things are going well, but there's physical injury of some sort. Mm -hmm. Either a dog bites you, you get herpes, or you have stabbing pains in your vagina, right? Not good, but at least you have emotional um, openness and availability. With somebody who you have emotional availability and who, like your current partner, presents as patient and knowledgeable, mm -hmm. you could find a way, and this needs to be done with great care, right, where um, the modality of the injury is predetermined so that in your um, patterning the the psyche goes yeah yeah there it is because there's a part of you that when you get injured goes there it is familiar Whew. right and now I'm not going to hell because something bad happened or whatever, whatever it is, right? Like some, some version of that where when the punishment happens, you're absolved. Yes, you do have a punishment for life, so maybe that absolves you. But, <laughs> but I would not rest on that particular set of circumstances. Yeah. I would assume that in your sexual relational pattern, there is a certain need for injury. Right, And if you don't bring on the injury, so to speak, the injury is brought on to you. And so I'd explore that pattern and come up with something, I don't know, a spanking or something, right? Nothing that debilitates you or really injures you, mm -hmm. but something that to your body-mind uh, qualifies as the injury that absolves you or redeems you, mm -hmm. right? Because this has a this has a... Uh, religious spiritual connotation, which is also why you end up with men who, uh, you know, have Kundalini crises. 
Yeah, don't worry about it. It's, it's, it, 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 it. We don't have to go in there. It's a spiritual, bodily thing that happens where people can go psychotic. So, uh, and do go psychotic on a regular basis. Um, it, it's that, that's neither here nor there. The, the way that links together is that you have a bend for spiritual punishment and redemption. Mm. So you're going to be attracted to men who have those kind of spiritual crises things themselves. Mm. Right? It's, a, it's, a, it's an imprint matching of some sort. Yeah. So they get with you, you have that thing, whatever we want to call it, the particular uh, injury, spiritual punishment, redemption kink. Let's call it that, right? <laughs> so your injury, spiritual... Uh, your, your injury... A uh, spiritual punishment redemption kink will attract somebody who has something similar in their imprint. So now they get with you, and you have that happening either in the emotional injury or in the physical injury, and they have it happening in their Kundalini awakenings or 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 uh, psychosis. Which are both, which both um, have the elements of the injury, the out of control, the punishment, the spiritual redemption. Right. So, so they're somehow, you know, we would have to dig a lot deeper to to really fine tune it. But I think you can work with that and see how that works. So, but that's neither here nor there because your current lover has already uh, inflicted, you know, permanent injury. Right. You just for the rest of your life going to deal with that particular thing, like for the rest of your life you have a scar. So, uh, you know, these are fairly major impact patterns. And I think your your friends and teachers and advisors, uh, you know, do have done well by advising you to look at it from all different aspects because uh, you could, you know, you could incur some real damage. And thank God you haven't yet, you know. <laughs> you know, but you could. So what I would do is I would find a way to preempt the uh, severity of the of the pattern, and and fine tune the the preemptive pattern uh, and pick something that's not permanently scarring or debilitating, but that hits that particular groove. Because that groove's there, right? And that groove gets hit, and so you want to hit it with the least impact. You have, to, you have to look for where the redemption happens, right? So there's a link between the punishment, what happens when you get punished, and how that redeems you or absolves you. Right, that's that's your thing. So the, the, your lover doesn't have to sign up, uh, uh, dress up like a priest. Your lover has to find the particular groove that gives you that release via the injury. And I'm saying quote unquote injury because ideally we don't want you to be stabbed or infected or stuff like that. But it will have to have a pain component of some sort, right? Um, hopefully very mild pain and hopefully in a very ritualized way where where that thing can play out without causing damage. I personally don't think you can ever get rid of a pattern because that's that's biologically impossible. As you know, a pathway in the brain is a pathway in the brain. It's connected to other pathways in the brain. So the best you can hope for is that that pathway is atrophied, less active. Right? That's the best you can hope for. But um, it's never going to completely go away because it's connected to love. It's connected to relationship. It's connected to your family, your upbringing. Uh, so I'm not sure that's true, but I would be ecstatic if it could be true. I know for myself, I work with somebody um, who, who is a, with several people who do something called Greenberg Method, which is is an energy release modality where you definitely can change your patterns in the body but stress as you well know will always activate the earliest pattern so 
Um, I'm all for you doing all the energy work you can. But in the meantime, I think you need to come to the bottom of what that one, two, three punch is and learn and find a way with the help of your lover, who I'm sure is very willing to go there to replicate it on an ongoing basis. So it doesn't escalate. Right. So it's a homeopathic dose of that particular thing on an ongoing basis so that you are um, not falling into the, in, into the cataclysmic you know, event. Okay. Because after a pit bull bite and a herpes uh, yeah. infection, yeah, so exactly. So, so like I said, we can talk about this offline meaning without, you know, because then you can really boil it down. And it is a very fine thing to do, but it can be done. Now, from a lineage viewpoint, meaning from, from the teachings of my lineage and my understanding of those and how they're translated, the sensitization mm -hmm. is a main component, a main component, and the other main component is a, let's put it this way, a proper relationship with the spiritual aspect. Right, you can turn that slightly off kilter um, relationship to the divine and write it. And so, if if I would work with you, aside from that particular piece, that's what I would offer you, right? And that what we talked about is um, connecting the things that are that are deeply valuable to you with the right relationship with the divine, so that that wonky thing doesn't happen. And that can be done. You know. So uh, this doesn't feel unworkable at all, uh, but it certainly feels urgent. The pointing towards the thing after the therapeutic work has been done reactivates the pattern. So... He's coming towards you. Everything's fine. His, he feels his lips warm. It's all good. He's kissing you, and you go, oh, it's cold, right? In that particular moment, all that is in the room is it's cold. And when, it, when an energy follows attention, right? So wherever attention goes, energy flows. So... Where is it going to go? The Arctic, pretty much. <laughs> right? Because his tepid lips to you are the Arctic. And then all your stuff kicks in. And then all his stuff kicks in. And then that's that. Right? So as the one who is not dealing with the actual physical thing that's happening... The best you can do is not say anything and continue. You just keep your mouth shut and focused on the kissing. I know that's going to take something. That, that is why it is esoteric advice, because everything in you needs to tell him that he's not okay, which is, of course, the very core of the core pattern. So you're still playing out this game of he isn't good enough. You are not good enough. Because if you were good enough, his lips were hot. If he was good enough, his lips were hot. Right? It, 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 it's, a, it's a constant hamster wheel of reinforcing, in, but disguised as working on it. 13 years? Okay. So in 13 years... Um, every time it's happened, you're shocked. Yeah. That's much more like it. Yeah. Right? And that's the core of his wounding. Yeah. No, that you don't, uh, essentially don't <laughs> like who he is in that moment. You don't like his cold lips. 13 years in, you're still surprised that his lips are cold when he's kissing you. Well, hope springs eternal, but... <laughs> but you have to remember that for him, cold lips means failure. It means rejection. It means inadequacy. So every time he kisses you, you go, Oh, shit, I'm still with this inadequate asshole. <laughs> That's what he's feeling. 
Yes. But there is no surprise why he's feeling it. You're giving a very clear message that says, I don't like you. You are not who I want you to be. I want you with hot lips. One day he's going to be dead. Really cold lips. No, I'm not kidding you, actually. I mean, try feeling your man and feel that this is going to make me cry, right? This guy, for 13 years has been dealing with the fact that you don't like his physiology and he's still kissing you. He's a fucking saint. For real. He's still turning towards the rejection over and over and over. You wouldn't turn towards the rejection for 13 years, right? So here's the thing. You feel rejected, so you're rejecting him. He feels rejected and he's still trying. You're still trying. You're still hoping his lips are hot. They're not. And one day, both of your lips will be very, very cold. And then you will have missed the chance to love each other despite the temperature difference. Because just imagine for a moment, there lies the man you love, dead, And you have to bend down and kiss his lips for the very, very last time. Would you not do that? Of course. So just treat it like that. Just go, this is the best this man has. And I'm going to love him. So my prescription for you would be, to in your mind and maybe aloud and just look around the room because everybody's crying <laughs> right because because what i would do if i were you this is my yogic prescription i love your cold lips i'm going to kiss them till they're cold forever that's what i would do with that right regardless of how your temperature is i love you Because that's also true. (laughs) Everything else is a delusion. In 13 years, the poor sod has never managed to kiss you without you being horribly upset by his temperature. In 13 years, you've rejected him and he's rejected you. So the only thing you can do at that point is to go fuck it mm. and love him anyway, exactly the way he is. And if you want a man who turns you on through his hot lips, divorce the poor guy and marry one with hot lips. You got one with cold lips. That's just the way it goes. If he had hot lips, there's something else that wouldn't turn you on because that's the nature of marriage, sadly. Right? I have never met anyone, including myself. I've been married for 15, 15 years, I think. Actually, 16. 16. <laughs> Two days from now. Mm-hmm. On the 16th, not today's the 15th, right? Or is today the 16th? Yeah, the 15th, yes. Yeah, so tomorrow I'll be married 16 years. So I sometimes can barely look at my husband. <laughs> Then other times I'm so crazy about it. But sometimes I'm like, don't you fucking even look in my direction. Like I'm so turned off. And then comes another wave where I'm like, oh my God, he's God, right? Like, I mean, that's just the nature of, of, of marriage. And there is things about my husband I don't like. And let me tell you something. There are things about me that my husband does not like. And I think there's probably more that he doesn't like about me because I'm extremely difficult as a human being, right? Extremely difficult. So what do you do? You accept the nature of relationship, which is something's got to turn you off. Something will. And if he had really hot lips... Something else would turn you off. Then it's the way he touches you. Or that, because it's your core wound and his core wound who are still dancing the tango. Yeah. He is clearly a saint. Because to stand in the face of rejection over and over and over and over isn't easy. 
same true for you. To stand in the face of rejection and still try isn't easy. I'm not saying he's a saint and you are not. But you could use your saintly pursuits to just love each other. So here's your mantra. I love your cold lips. <laughs> you say it internally. You say it aloud. You don't mean it. That's not the point. Eventually you will. You give it as a gift. You give it as a gift. You say to your man, I love you. And the way you say love you, I love you is I love your cold lips. Just imagine. Or well, for the rest of his life, his lips will be cold. For the rest of his life, you are not going to feel good about it. Well, you have two options. You can either get with the program or divorce him. Those are your two options. If He sounds like a really, really good man. So why don't you just... Get with it. If you kiss him properly, his lips will warm up. And I guarantee you, I would almost bet my considerable ass on this, <laughs> that, that if you give that praise, cold lips are not going to be his issue. I can almost guarantee you that, but that's not why you want to do it. You want to do it out of the generosity of your loving heart. Because one day he'll be dead and, and he will probably die before you as men do. And then what? Then you're going to put him down there in that hole or in the incinerator or whatever you do with him at that point, knowing that he never felt accepted kissing you, the woman he loved so much, right? The love of his life. He could never make it right by her. Why would you do that to a guy or to yourself? Give him the gift of your love and just get with the cold lips. <laughs> I know you feel like you're selling out and you're giving up and all of that. But 13 years into it, I think you could give him a gift. And yourself, because every time you say, I love your cold lips... Right? And, and, and see what happens. And I will love you regardless of the temperature of your lips for the rest of our lives. You will unfreeze as 